Um, thank you all for coming and our main presenters were unable to make it due to un, uh, other things that came up and uh, we were I was just been going to be involved just to share our portion of it in Kluckwan and um, we were fortunate that they sent their slides and so I'm going to try to do the best I can in sharing and um, I've kind of been involved in the long ago man project for since it's, since um, we've all found out about it and so excuse my but for those that, of you guys that don't know me my name is Marsha Hotch my Tlingit name is Kuneunte and I am of um, the Ganachtedi from Klakwan. I'm also from the Ishkahit, which is Ishkatan, Gunusshish, and um, I'm Shangukedi Yeti. I, my father is from the Thunderbird House, Gunusshish, Gunusshish Tlakat Yohan. I guess. Can you guys hear me now? There we go. <laughs> um, the name that you see up there is Kawa de Dun Chi, and it's Tashoni, meaning long ago person found. And this photo that we're looking at is the glacier where they found him. In August 14, 1999, three gentlemen, they were teachers, and um, they were school teachers. They were going on a hunt, a uh, sheep, mount, mountain sheep, and the uh, Tatshahini area, down towards the Alsac. And um, they were helicoptered into the area. And as they were there at the glacier, um, they discovered the body of long ago man, long ago person found. And at that, I think we were very fortunate that they were teachers and they hiked back out. It was several days uh, as they hiked back out and reported it to the government and um, the First Nations. The long ago man was found in um, the portion of British Columbia, and it's about 50 miles north of Klukwan. Um, the area is actually co-managed with Champagne Asiac First Nations, and it's their traditional territory. And on this photo, we get a better idea of where this is the area of the find, of where they found him. Can, yes. And I believe, whoa, I lost my cursor. <laughs> and it's near the Alsak River, or Alsek, is that correct? And here we have a better view of the, um, you can see the corridor, the O'Connor Glacier. Get my, and as we're looking towards Yakutat, Yakutat, and there's the Tat Shahini. <coughs> and going towards Klukwan. This is the area where he was found.
The Champagne Asiac, um, they are the First Nations in, in um, the Yukon area, uh, Haynes Junction area, Champaign, and um, they have Tlingit and Tishoni is their backgrounds and um, as you can see their slide, the slide is pretty much self-explanatory. And in 1993 they signed their land claim agreement and they are self-governing and they have a um, When the long ago man was discovered, they had a gathering with their elders and they had a discussion a few days before. And there you can see them, they gathered. And some of the elders that are in this photo are no, some of them are no longer alive, and it's been about 10 years now since um, they did this gathering, and they had to make decisions really fast. Were they going to be involved in this? And they felt like it was very important that they be involved, and so they decided at this gathering that they were going to be involved, and so they went ahead and they were flown up to the glacier. This is the First Nations and plus some of the BC government. And there you can see them up on the glacier. As they were there, they had conducted, um, this was a very serious thing and they had done um, like a ceremony, uh, they were respectful, and the scientific team, and, and they had um, forensic control. You can see they had their white outfits on, and they didn't want to mix their DNA with, with the find. And before they really began their, um, first of all, they did remove the body out of there. And then they went to the table and started discussing, negotiating their co-management agreement with the British Columbia government and the First Nations, Champagne Asiac. And they came to an agreement that the uh, British Columbia government would take the lead on the scientific studies and um, they would conduct the autopsy and um, Champagne Asia would take the lead on the cultural matters. And I really have to commend them because they, I really feel like they did a wonderful job in stepping up to, to this responsibility. They saw it as their responsibility and they followed through. And they wanted to learn more about the long ago man, who he was, where was his people. They had all kinds of questions. Um, this is a, a book, and there's the, what was featuring the long ago man. Um, they found that he was a young male and they didn't know the cause of death and they found some um, material with him they found a hat and he was carrying salmon and in the scientific studies I attended the symposium last week or about a week and a half ago that was in Haynes Junction and um, they showed the scientists had pictures of the 
fish scales, and so they were. That's how they know that um, they even know what kind of fish he had. He had he had um, sockeye. And the data find when when it first occurred, when they first did their carbon studies, they said about 500 years, but uh, the updated new one is anywhere from 300 to. Um, so that date on this slide um, is probably not right. The First Nations uh, started having meetings with uh, people from Alaska in the southeast in the region there and all of the First Nations around them. and. In May, we, the Chilkat Indian Village, attended this meeting. We had a part in it also, and um, I believe Sea Alaska was represented, Yakutat was represented. Um, there was invitations that went out to all the communities, and it was a large um, gathering. We gathered in a room about this size, and it was a discussion about whether or not um, the things were going to be buried with them, the, the materials that they found with him, the hat, the, the knives, and whether or not they were going to cremate him or, or bury him. And so these were the things that um, they consulted with the communities and the elders, and especially the elders. And everybody contributed something to. And then in 2001, we did have a funeral, and um, people from Yakutat and Southeast, many people, and a lot of people from Kluckwan and the Haines area went up. We had two buses available, and um, we hauled a lot of people up, and it was a fun time. And he the they eventually decided to cremate him, and um, the materials that was found with him was kept. And there you see um, George Ramos there, and they brought the hat and some of the things that was found there. And there they helicoptered back. He's not in the same site, but he's in the vicinity. And um, he was returned where he was found. And we also decided in Pluckwan that we would have a 40-day party for him after that burial. So in September of that 2001, we did have a burial, uh, excuse me, a 40-day party. And we didn't know what plan at that time. And, but we, know, we knew that um, the First Nations Tribal Council had really gone through a stressful, stressful time in trying to do the right things and not step over boundaries with even their elders and and trying to meet the needs of the the needs and wants of the regional at a, at a regional level so um, it was our way of thanking them for taking on that responsibility and so we had this this 40-day party um, our elder Joe, he's sitting in the back of the room there with us. Um, and we also put the healing robe that was made in the village that our tribe uses as a logo, and it's called the healing robe. And we, we robed their president. 
Charlie. Charlie. I forgot him. Bob Charlie? Bob Charlie. Bob Charlie. Sheesh. And we also had a dance. They brought a group of children, and our children danced with them, and we just had a good time that night. And since the um, finding of Long Ago Man, they have gone back and checking for if anything else came. As you saw in the, the book there, um, they only found certain parts of his body. And they did find more pieces that they didn't originally find. And um, they did find the skull. And, um, and they returned those as they found them. And you can see what a difference the ice that that glacier is melting has really melted down. And so here's another photo. Um, what they did find, that's in gray. And what they didn't find is in um, white. But since then, um, they have gone back and they found more. And in 2004, there was more found. They kept going back. And each time they found anything, they really scanned the area very well. Look at how much that ice has melted, even just in such a short time. Um, the scientists actually had a really nice comparison photo as, as the years was going, but we've got a pretty good idea here. Um, all, all the body parts that they did find did go to the burial site, and they didn't bring anything out. They kept the, um, like the sticks that they found. They would helicopter in and um, check the area over. I can't say too much. Oh, there you go. By Samuel Glacier, and then you got the O'Connor. The First Nations has the authority over the um, artifacts that was found, the, the hat, the tzauch. With him, other than the hat, they found um, a gopher robe. And it, there you can see it in bits and pieces. And um, as they pieced it together down on that photo at the bottom there where you got, it looks like a puzzle. There was like 94, ni 95 gophers, you know, it, it took to make that, that robe. And they found a lot of ochre. Did I say that correctly? And, um, A lot of sinew for for the sewing of it, and they did DNA studies of the different parts of it, and um, so that's how they identified um, the sinew, and they found the sinew to some of the sinew to be whale sinew. And that first photo up there on your, that would be your left, that's when they first found it. And then as they dried it out, they were able to open it up. And there we have a photo of a Toshoni wearing a a gopher robe. 
Um, robes were quite, um, I remember growing up with them and seeing them, and I actually had one that my father had given me when I was a little child. Um, and there you can see in the whale house, they're, they're showing a, a gopher robe one of the gentlemen's wearing in the background there and um, some of the gatherings that we had when we got together some people brought their gopher robes and there you can see photos and they had a workshop in 2007 and 8 and they gathered their gophers and they they had actually wonderful pictures from the symposium from the other week and they showed where they were how they were snaring them because along with the longo man one of those sticks that they found with him was supposedly a gopher to help set up snares and um, there you have some of the elders working with the younger ladies and they were teaching them how to make the robes and they learned together and there on the that would be on your left there's some of the elders there Frances Olas she was one of the ladies that really worked on that and there is the hat that um, was found with him when they got up on the glacier um, Diane Strand was one of the ones that went up with them and when they were landing from the helicopter blades and it caused up a, a wind there and Fr Diane saw this thing fly up in the air and so when they landed she ran over there and so if you see photos uh, you'll see with Lorraine's photo and also on the posters over there um, that's her holding it that was when they first got there and so it's all dried out now and um, this is what it looks like they found it to be made of spruce root and um, you look at it and um, we did a we tried to do a replica of the long ago man hat. I forgot what year it was. Um, there you go. You have more photos of the hat in the beautiful tiny weaving. If you if you're a weaver, you know that was a lot of work, and especially if you gather, it's a lot of gathering too. Um, here you see Dolores and Ruth Casco. They both went up together, and I think some of you guys. And they went up and they studied the long ago Manhattan. And um, Ruth is no longer with us, but she had um, instigated a workshop. Let's try to make one. And, um, so there we are on the bottom there. We planned it and we collaborated with the university and people got credit for to also for working uh, on weaving. And with it, we, the Chilcat Indian Village hosted this workshop. And there you see Ann Smith, who is a weaver from Whitehorse. And That's our workshop. It was at the ANS Hall. And there's Ruth. Um, we were not able to, um, this was during the 9-11. And at that time, Dolores came, and then she had people in Sitka harvesting roots for us so that we could prepare it and um, and then the 9-11 happened, 
and our roots, our box of roots, raw roots, got stuck here in Juneau and for that whole week we didn't get it and so here we were in the middle of our project we didn't have all our material and um, thankful to my husband Don Don Hutch senior and he took time off from fishing and he took us to go harvesting roots and so we went by one of the glaciers up there in the Lynn Canal and we were able to get roots and um, then we had to start splitting and as if you're a weaver you know that takes time too and so here we were trying to get our project done and then um, so we I think there's photos over there too um, of us splitting the roots and so we had to do that and we were fortunate that Lorraine over here, she's sitting with her, the hat that we, that I think we all had a hand in by preparing the material and working together. So it kind of was team effort and um, she was fortunate too. And her mother's is almost done and I think she's going to finish that. Also, in one of the times when they had gone back, they also found a copper bead, and they didn't know if it was kind of attached to his hat or if it was something he wore around his neck. It's really, really tiny. It looks huge here. <laughs> and he also had a, a bag with him, and they found that to be beaver. Uh, they, it was moose sinew again here. They also found a knife with him, and most of the metal, the iron blade is gone, but it is iron. And it was in a sheath that was made for it. Here are some of the wooden tools that was found with him. And there's that tool that uh, they figured it was to help set snares. And they demonstrated at the symposium how they utilized those little tools in setting up a snare. And you can see the markings on it, on, on the side. And there were longer poles that they also found with them. And gaff poles. Those of you that have walked rivers and um, you know, you use a, a walking pole to check your depth as you're going across. And <coughs> and there are some more that they found. And as you can see, it was found Further up, this, the scientists had wonderful locations on where they found these pieces on, on their slide. So it, it was. He was in good health. Um, actually, uh, I found this kind of interesting that there was uh, a TB bacteria, but it wasn't, it wasn't developed um, and there you can see he had a parasite and um, they were fascinated by the indentation of his skull as you can see there it could have been from when he was a baby being in a cradle Is they had conducted an isotope study of his bones and they found that he grew up on salmon and 
other saltwater fish and um, shellfish. Uh, but also on his hair, they found that the last few months he was eating a lot of um, meat. So he had to have been in the interior. Um, maybe he was going back inland. We don't know. We're just speculating there. Um, and there you see, because of the DNA studies, that they found it to be sockeye salmon. And also, they really checked the pollen that was on his gopher robe and in the hair, and they found that um, also in his stomach he had um, sea asparagus. And some of you guys probably remember some scientists coming around and checking, looking around for sea, sea asparagus in the southeast. Uh, Pedra was one of the scientists that I remember, and Dixon. He had coastal plants, um, and he had animal. They checked, they really did a, a really in-depth autopsy on him. And there you have the, the pollen studies. And they found like mineral grains from the glacier, probably from the water that he drank. And they were like again. I think I think we're we're just speculating. We don't know which way he was really going, but because he had fish, they assumed he was coming from Klukwan, going into the interior. Um, some of these didn't come through, I believe, on um, since we just had these emailed. And um, but. Some of you may be familiar with the Koklux map, and that was, I believe, what was supposed to be here. And many of the routes that they they had taken or was documented in that map. <coughs> um, many of the elders were interviewed and as most of us know our traditional stories share about times of when we went over the glaciers and under the glaciers and um, they had interviewed a lot of their elders and one of the elders that had really uh, gave them guidance and advised them had passed away recently. Um, and there are some stories also from Klukwan. Um, I think we've gone through this. Um, the hat was the Tlingit style, and he had a knife, a bear, beaver skin bag. He was wearing a copper bead. Um, the DNA studies, the Chilkoot Indian Association had contributed a large amount of money so that this DNA studies could be conducted and also various other groups. Um, See Alaska also contributed so that this DNA study can be done. They have also found um, direct descendants from the long ago man. And 
as you can see, I, I confess I, I did it, but I wasn't one of them. And um, they went around to the different communities. Unfortunately, some communities were missed out, and not everybody did it. It was only, I think, 200 and some people that had done it. And um, they followed, I'm going to make hash out of this. My two, somebody said it. <laughs> but they followed the lineage on the mother's side. And, and I find this very, very fascinating. This is my own words here, is that our people knew, even them that uh, you follow the lineage on your mother's side. And, um, and so this study that they did, this is the one way that they can trace it back is on the female side. Um, the female is able to carry this certain DNA down, but if she had brothers, if the female had brothers, he wouldn't be able to carry that down to his children. Just the female can carry it down. And so they found, that's how they found direct descendants to the long ago man. Can, can we? I just, <coughs> sorry, I think that this is really important that um, one day Dan Chinchin didn't have a direct during the symposium that they kind of explained that that, that red box there um, in the center right to be plot A. And he carries the mitochondrial DNA from his mother, which we will see the red opal on mm -hmm. the top. Mm -hmm. And then the people who uh, tested positive to, to have the same mitochondrial DNA are the ones either to the right or to the left in red. Yeah. And it follows your mother's here. Yeah. And, and all here. those people, we, yeah. We, we but have, he. But he didn't have any direct descendants because it's like the kind of system mm -hmm. and in the way that the man isn't the one that's passing down um, the, the association. But it's Yeah. I hope you guys all heard that. Um. I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understand it. Are you saying like the first generation from the mother, male and female, inherit the DNA? Yes. But then the second generation, the males don't pass it on. Exactly. Maybe some of you understand this chart? But it was really interesting when they were explaining this at the symposium. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. So I decided to leave this in there because it's not. And there you can see the Quade Dun Sinchi and how they. And here they have the, the family tree, I think, as they were um, everybody that participated. I actually like the other chart better than this one at the symposium. So I'm going to. Um, they had 17 steady participants. Um, the pictures also didn't come out here again. And most of them are from the wolf or eagle. And it was on both sides of the border. Um, those who are Tishoni belong to the wolf clan. And those who are Tlingit are either Duklawadi or Yanyadi. Those that did the study. Um, Six of the 17 matches fit in the genealogy chart. Uh, and I believe everybody has been identified and contacted.
but I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go there. Goodness, cheesh. Um, I'll leave that up there. Um, I really want to thank the Champagne Ajac for giving us this opportunity, even though they're not here with us today, unfortunately. And um, uh, from my involvement, I see this as a special time of bringing the First Nations and the people here in Alaska together. And this only goes to show that there is no border with us. So I think they did a wonderful job in taking on that huge, huge responsibility and they footed most of the bill for taking care of things and, and we owe them a gratitude of thanks. And also Lorraine is here, Lorraine Casco. She's the one that finished from our workshop. She was the only one that finished that hat replica and she brought it down, and rightfully so, when she made it. And in my way of thinking, you know, like, what are you going to do with your hat? And I could just see her wearing it and, and dancing in it. And she said, I'm going to give it to my cousin. And, and she gave it to her cousin, who is the caretaker of the duck lady the Keet Gushi hit, and rightfully so. And I just wanted to say also, most of the people that were involved in the long ago man were ravens. And I think there was one person who was adopted, and she was adop adopted into the wolf clan, and um, she had passed away shortly thereof of a 40-day party. I believe it was that winter, Sarah Gaunt. And um, she did a wonderful job, too. But uh, Clarence Joe, Sheila Greer, um, Diane Strand, uh, they did a wonderful job, and they're a wonderful team. So, Gunnar Chish, Lakat Johan.